Activists, artists, and citizens from nearly all walks of life and perspectives have struggled to reach beyond the limits of mainstream media. Whether it's Fox News or the New York Times, Rush Limbaugh or Brian Williams, people say they are tired of being talked to or overlooked. They seek to exercise their own rights to free speech, to fulfill a need to hear from independent voices. They exercise their rights and fulfill their needs by creating new avenues for speech, by inventing new forms of communication, and by seizing the microphone to speak to their community. This movement did not begin and does not end with the internet or social media. It is a movement as old as the dawn of mass media. This series will highlight the contributions of alternative media and the challenges citizens face in a political environment that seems to reward only those with the most money, a political environment that does not necessarily reward those with the best ideas or those who serve the critical information needs of their community. We're looking beyond mainstream media. My name is Mark Lloyd. I'm the director of the Media Policy Initiative here at the New America Foundation. And we're going to have a conversation with Sandy Close, the executive editor and founder of New America Media. A top flight journalist covering stories from the Vietnam War to local elections in California, Sandy Close received a MacArthur Foundation Genius Award and the George Polk Career Award, mainly because of her tireless advocacy on behalf of youth and ethnic media. New America Media is the country's first and largest national collaboration of ethnic news organizations. It reaches over 57 million Americans through an active network of over 3,000 media outlets, including TV, radio, online, and print. New America Media works with policymakers, academia, mainstream media, and advertisers to connect to Americans too often marginalized in our media ecology. The New American Media News Service provides news in a variety of different languages. They also create opportunities for dialogue between journalists and community and with local and international leaders. New American Media also provides training to budding journalists and recognizes their work through a variety of award programs held in various cities across the nation. Working with Sergio Ben Dixon in the field poll, New America Media has promoted the use of multilingual polls to try to better understand the needs and the power of the increasingly diverse American communities. As part of our series, Beyond Mainstream Media, I sat down to talk with Sandy Close about her work as a journalist and the work of New America Media. I actually wanted to be a missionary. When I grew up uh, a in missionary. New York, I wanted to be a missionary. Mm-hmm. I was very influenced by... Uh, the experience of going to an Irish working class Catholic church Mm -hmm. where you had splinters from the cross Mm -hmm. passed around relics, Mm -hmm. thanks to growing up in a city, Manhattan, where I would have seen every movie playing in every movie theater uh, and Hollywood just sucked me in. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I conceived the idea of going to China and then I got into the history and and really found that writing was what I did best. Mm-hmm. So when I graduated uh, from Berkeley, mm-hmm. where I had gone to study Chinese, mm-hmm. uh, I headed to Hong Kong. Uh-huh. And it was uh, 1964. I mean, the story of the mid-century was Vietnam mm-hmm. and China. Sure. Sure. So. I just walked into a wide open journalistic landscape. If you spoke English as your native language, you were way ahead of the curve. Forget that you were 21. Forget that the folks hiring you at the Far Eastern Economic Review thought you had gone to Berkeley University. Uh, It was like, um, you know, compared to being a young woman in those years trying to get a job in journalism in the United States, it wouldn't have happened. In 64. 1964. So I became the China editor of the Far Eastern <laughs> Economic Review. I laugh about it because I, my first article was steel factories in China, um, communist China. And you remember this? Oh, I, I learned journalism from an absolutely amazing editor who was Welch, who would take his felt-tip pen and reduce my entire page to one paragraph in, in really quite eloquent, eloquent calligraphy. But uh, through the review, I traveled all through Southeast Asia. I reported on Vietnam. I, I really became a China hand in Asia and knew some of the great 
reporters in those mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, and when I came back to the United States, I, I thought I've got to learn more about economics. I tried graduate school. It lasted one semester, and I went screaming into Oakland and started my own newspaper mm -hmm. because I missed that hands-on immediacy away from the world of abstractions. Mm -hmm. Let me pull you back for just a little bit, and, and, and if you could talk about reporting and writing about the war in Vietnam and what, what that meant to you. You know, um, the, my, I have to be honest and say that my major beat was covering China, mm -hmm. based in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but I managed to do a lot of reporting on Hong Kong as well. Mm -hmm. And then in, in Southeast Asia, Cambodia, where no... American journalists were allowed to go, so I went as a student. Uh, and there were some advantages to being very young. Mm -hmm. I can't say I was a huge contributor as a journalist, but in the review, the stories I was doing, uh, I think, um, were definitely ground up stories as opposed to going to the joint US military advisory group in the embassy who would have been happy to say, you want to do Buddhist today, Here's, here are your sources, mm -hmm. here are the places you go. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing grassroots journalism. The connection though, Mark, is with the Asian experience and my experience running a newspaper in Oakland, which was predominantly black, uh, was assuming the stories were two feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you could say I was more anthropological in my approach. I really wanted to make sense out of ordinary people. I remember in, in Vietnam, the first thing people would ask you is, have you eaten? And do you have children? Mm -hmm. And that, that made a big impression on me <laughs> because, uh, and that was true in North Vietnam as well. Mm -hmm. And it was taking people on their terms seriously. And well, it, it just infected me. One of the things that, that's always um, impressed me about you is that you have such a global perspective about things, uh, whether it is your uh, understanding and embrace of Asia or Africa, um, but at the same time, much of the work that you seem to do is what they, they call now hyper-local. Um, so while it's a global perspective, it's a focus very much on personal lives and how people meet their every day. Um, it is not a perspective that we see quite often here in Washington reporting. Uh, and yet if you go back to that, trend. Uh, we saw it so much in California. Mm -hmm. uh, I came back from Asia and it was like America was the unknown country. Mm -hmm. I was rediscovering it all over again. I think the understanding of the question in Vietnam of, of have you had food and do you have children mm -hmm. was that the primary actors in life are people. Connect for me that idea and the practice of journalism. So was it the goal of telling the story of how people are actually living their lives and the forces that they're running up against, or what was it? Well, coming back to the United States, mm -hmm. to a city like Oakland, mm -hmm. uh, which was in, in the 70s really beginning to experience a crisis of deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. Uh, outsourcing. Uh, it's funny, just when the civil rights uh, legislation was supposed to open up possibilities, cities were going through hell. Sure. And you, you saw that sure. with sure. Uh, <laughs> if, if finally blacks were being elected as mayors, people in the black community used to say, yeah, we're, we're, we're being elected to run the cemeteries. I mean, because cities in all of the major newspapers right in 1980 and the magazine's urban crisis, the death of cities. In fact, cities were being reborn. And what you were seeing, particularly in a state like California, was the profound effect of immigration. 
uh, of of this whole uh, of the global economy. Now, who was with, reporting on this? We're, well, we were Pacific yeah. News Service. I took over Pacific yeah. News Service in 1974. Our great beats were all of these uh, transformations that were going on from the bottom up mm -hmm. that were off the radar mm -hmm. because in a Watergate mm -hmm. era, people were spellbound still mm -hmm. by public policy by wrongdoing in the public realm. Sure, well, sure. meanwhile, demography in California was transforming itself, and anyone standing on the street corner could see it. Yeah. We were going from a black-white world that the Kerner Commission report right. documented right. and remained the sort of Bible for people to understand right. race relations. Right. Young people were growing up in entirely new realities. Right. And so we started doing not just journalism, but forums that brought the people we were reporting on to the round table with the experts to speak directly. And I, I think I, for whatever reason out of, and maybe this was the missionary instinct coming back, I couldn't just do the reporting. Right. I wanted to find out ways we could change things Right after the reporting. Now, so now you, you, you've immediately raised something that, that seems to be um, a real difference between mainstream media and the sort of media that in journalism that you were practicing in Oakland. You're talking about actually being engaged with the community. Now, is, yes. is that a That's, key difference? Uh, it, well, I'm, I'm not sure when mainstream media lost those connections mm -hmm. because, after all, a lot of the newspapers like the Chronicle grew out of people who wanted to make sense out of the city around them. Mm -hmm. By the late 60s, newspapers were run by people who didn't even live in those cities. The reporters didn't live in those cities. So, and, and the demographics of those cities were changing. So there was a kind of there was a kind of um, gap that really developed between the mainstream media sector, whose vision, I think, was always very compelling to give us a sense of who we are becoming collectively. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just the media that changed, it was the, the audience that changed. And neither knew each other. We found so much energy and vitality right and interethnic relationships, a new map, a new landscape. Well, there's Marco Polo. We want to do the <laughs> mapping of these landscapes. And in the course of doing that, we started doing youth communication. I didn't want to call it journalism mm -hmm. because I wasn't thinking we were training these young people right. Right. to become Mike Wallace. Right. Uh, that would be icing on the cake if it happened, but it was more training young people who had grown up with no sense they had a voice. And this is the reason for the start of Youth Outlook, or, yes. or YO. Yes, right, right. and it, it really right. was greedy. It, yeah. It's all driven, right. Mark, by this desire, forget the missionary. That was, if you find something, if you find somebody in Vietnam, and this is a real story, wounded, do you leave him on the road in order to find your story, or do you take him to the hospital? Well, I'm one of the ones who took him to the hospital and was late filing the story. Maybe that was the missionary. Maybe that was just feminism. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> anyway, I could only say that, that the um, desire to bring the voices in the stories we were doing right. directly to philanthropy, to researchers, to policymakers and to uh, advocacy groups mm -hmm. was huge. Mm -hmm. So we began these oral journalism mm -hmm. projects, mm -hmm. mapping the new right. landscape right. of race relations, right. bringing uh, the, the undocumented uh, uh, immigrants who were, this was 1986 when the last great immigration reform. Right. I mean, this was pre-Oprah, you understand, but in a way probably like Oprah, we got audiences that were just fascinated by this. And it built Pacific News Service's reputation for doing, I guess, sure. what we then later sure. called civic engagement journalism. Sure. Sure. But out of that came our youth work and the realization as a journalist, 
you could do more than gathering and disseminating information and news, you could also convene people. And that that was, mm -hmm. communication could be part of journalism. Now, nobody does that better than ethnic media. Ethnic media as a sector is almost, defines itself as convener of community. Now, what is ethnic media? So why, why wouldn't, say, the Wall Street Journal be ethnic media? What do, what do, what do you mean when you say okay. ethnic media? Well, ethnic media has the unfortunate uh, use of a word that sounds parochial and very insular. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you've indicated, it's global local. Mm -hmm. It's actually cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. But in its in in the in the terms we've used, mm -hmm. ethnic media means news organizations could also be entertainment, but we've particularly grown our relationships with ethnic news organizations, mm -hmm. have specific ethnic markets that they target. And their role as they've seen their role, because many of them are started not by journalists, but by people who want to give back to their communities and create a platform that will shed light and project the voices of those communities. If you look at the first black newspaper, mm -hmm. Freedom Journal, mm -hmm. in 1824, its mission statement is, we wish to plead our own cause mm -hmm too long have others spoken for us. The use of the word we is still very relevant to the role ethnic media play today. It is not the I journalism of the blog. I speak with the authority of myself. For it's all the strengths and weaknesses, it is the we journalism. It is the collective sensibility, the window into the collective reality, the chronicler of the collective experience that is the strength of ethnic media and its distinctive genre. Don't forget, it extends back into the founding of the country, mm -hmm. even prior mm -hmm. Spanish language newspaper in New Orleans, as Felix Gutierrez and others have documented. It's, it's as old as the country, Native American mm -hmm. media that gave rise to the Sacramento Bee, mm -hmm. German newspapers that gave rise mm -hmm. to Ritter that became Night Ritter. Mm -hmm. So it's not new, but the growth of it with the immigrant, uh, the changing demographics of the country from the 70s, 60s and 70s on, the growth was dramatic. Mm -hmm. And we uh, began to really reach out to ethnic media in the mid 90s because we realized it was impossible to do the role of mainstream journalism when you didn't know what these uh, voices and, and platforms for discovering whole communities around you growing, becoming the new majority of California. Now, one of the things that's, that's always interesting to me when, I, when I, I talk with you about this is that you don't talk about money. Uh, except maybe from the foundation community, but mainly you're not talking about how much money you make from the community that you're trying to sell a paper or a service to. Um, that's, uh, that's not how many of us think about media these days. So, so media, uh, if, if we look back to that first poll yeah. that you and I were involved in and presented in New York and, and really... Um, made a, I think, a significant impact that as much as one out of four ethnic adults in America, Asian, Hispanic, African American, identified ethnic media as their primary or secondary source of news and information. Mm -hmm. That was way bigger than the corner grocery store rag mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. described ethnic mm -hmm. media as. Mm -hmm. The uh, fact that this media had such a large uh, audience, mm -hmm. yet was completely invisible to or ignored by advertisers. Mm -hmm. Your own study documented that in New York uh, and um, showed that if government is the 20th biggest advertiser in the country, yet has less than, I think you found, two or three percent 
of ad dollars in New York going to black or Hispanic media at a time that population was growing. You essentially were looking at communications apartheid in advertising, and it persists to this day, but what changed it was the 2010 census, which for the first time represented the government. Uh, for the first time, the government, actually, the U.S. census committed over 50% of its ad dollar to advertising in ethnic and community media. Well, long, long before 2010, I think uh, before I met you, would, uh, after you had started New California Media, uh, I think you were bringing attention to the power of ethnic audiences and the importance of advertising in ethnic media. Um, why do you think that push, that uh, goal of organizing ethnic media into a force that advertisers might recognize was, was so important for you? Because the media asked us to do it. Mm -hmm. Believe me, um, I remember <laughs> so my the ethnic early, media came to yes, you and, said, and said, look, it's wonderful you're doing awards, <laughs> yeah. and it's wonderful you're doing training, and you've got a television show that is expanding our visibility, and our dream, all of us want to do this AP of ethnic right, media, right. this exchange, but honest to God, we're dying for advertising uh -huh, dollars. Uh -huh. And uh, and I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> and let's do an expo and bring the advertisers. And I, I knew very little, but I've come to be fascinated by advertising. It, mm -hmm. it is a, its own uh, f form of communication. It's fascinating. The ethnic media, by and large, and I'll go back to one of the people who was very influential, Monica Lozano, mm -hmm. the uh, publisher sure. of La Opinion. Opinion. Um, when I first got to know her back in 1996, she, I said, Monica, what, are, what does ethnic media mean to you? And she said, um, well, I will tell you one thing. We've just had the fifth year of um, being a uh, in the red, and we're doing this for commitment to our community. And commitment to community is what ethnic media means to me, she said. Her brother gave another spin to this, which I've also found eloquent over the years. And this was also 1996. He said, ethnic media, it's convener of community. One of the things that I, I would like for you to talk a little bit about is the role of uh, Asian language papers, particularly in politics in California. The polling, we had the field poll due of voters in 2010 and 2012 for the first time in language of Asian voters as well as Spanish, in Spanish, and of African Americans. Basically, made it very clear, without the ethnic voter, California would be a red state. That this is a swing vote that ultimately determined mm -hmm. key propositions, key mayorality races. And um, if you looked at that aggregate, ethnic voter became, in the voice of Mark D. Canillo, the pollster, um, the driver in electoral politics in California today. That said, our polling also showed that over half of these voters draw their news and information, the opinions they have about a wide range of issues from ethnic media. So this is no small sector. If you look at a city like San Francisco, the change has been very rapid. Uh, up until really five years ago, four years ago, there were no Chinese on the governing board of supervisors in San Francisco. A liberal city, but not a tolerant city. Mm -hmm. The 2000, thanks to Willie Brown, the mayor, the then mayor, for the first time City Hall in San Francisco allowed ethnic media into the press room to have desks. It took until the year 2000. The minute that happened, 
two Chinese media had desks and a Korean media. We bought the desks at Costco, because I, I remember. And, uh, and I had to get Mayor Brown to come down to the press room and say, yes, we're going to put these desks here, because several mainstream media said, what are they doing? Well, the minute these desks went into operation, Willie Brown became front page news in the Chinese language media day after day after day because they were right there in City Hall. They were able to have daily access. His first election, he had 30% of the Chinese vote as mayor. When he ran again after 2000, he had 70. Wow. So he became a great advocate of Western media. He used to say, use it or lose it. Why is it that mainstream media would not provide the same service to the Asian American community in California or um, the Latino community in Texas or uh, the African American community in Georgia? Well, I think there was, Mark, in the late 90s, an ambition to do that. And I think with the 2000 census, a realization they would be in real trouble if they didn't. What happened uh, with, I think, many people in mainstream journalism who were fired up by and inspired by this idea of becoming more inclusive, um, unfortunately ran smack into a disinvestment mm -hmm. in the sector, mm -hmm. changes of ownership. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what you've got, from my point of view, is a journalism landscape of very exciting to see new generations of journalists coming into do-it-yourself journalism. We used to be, we used to think of of this as freelance reporters. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. bless freelance reporting. Uh, so many stories have been broken by accident, sure. almost by sure. these journalists. Sure. Sure. But now it's startups through technology of nonprofit online journalism, which is exciting to see, but less diverse, frankly, than the mainstream media sector that preceded it. With everything from climate change to education reform to the Affordable Care Act. How do you get this information to this very fragmented, diverse right. population? Right. Ethnic media is still absolutely indispensable because people to trust the information have to trust the messenger. Now, uh, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of despair, frankly, about the state of media and journalism today, the lack of revenues coming in as a result of being drawn off by um, new technologies. Um, what's the state of ethnic media? It's, it's definitely been clobbered as the whole uh, news media sector has been clobbered by the recession. Uh, it's crunched even more because it didn't have the kind of investment of academia and philanthropic organizations that helped open technology and uh, build a skill set among journalists like myself who weren't raised on digital media. Mm -hmm. um, ethnic media's had to grapple with uh, balancing uh, investments in reporting and investments in technology. The strengths ethnic media have is that they're used to doing more with, with less. less yeah. So they have ridden through the recession more with more endurance, I think, than perhaps other sectors. <laughs> 